Welcome back to the Mac Deck Tech. Today we have another custom build featuring Mr. House, President and CEO from the Fallout Universes Beyond sets. Uh, I definitely chose to take my copy out of Caesar's Legion. Uh, I didn't really feel like it fit the theme aside from being a New Vegas card. Mr. House, President and CEO is a 04 legendary artifact creature that's a human uh whenever you roll a die and you get a four or higher you're going to create a three three robot creature uh if you happen to roll a six or higher you're going to create that robot and a treasure you can also pay four mana and tap it to roll a six out of die plus an additional six out of die for each mana from a treasure spent to activate the ability so it kind of feeds into itself once you have it going so, what are we doing? Well, we're rolling a lot of dice. Uh, not just D6s, but like primarily D20s. I think there's a couple other levels of dice throughout the, the deck, but we're primarily doing some D20 nonsense. Uh, we're also really focused on generating treasures, not just from Mr. House, but from other cards to ensure that we're kind of getting this value. So, let's start off with some dice rollers. We have Ancient Brass Dragon, Copper Dragon, and Gold Dragon. Each of them have an on attack trigger. We're going to roll a d20 and we're going to get various things. Uh, the most important of which comes from the Ancient Copper Dragon itself. So the Ancient Copper Dragon on attack is going to let us roll a d20 and create that many treasure tokens. Uh, this is fantastic, right? We're going to get it out as quick as possible. Start making a bunch of treasure, which is already just good value. But with Mr. House, we really get to, like, gain extra value from not only the die roll, but spending those treasures to then activate Mr. House. So I think we're in a good spot here. Brazen Dwarf follows up those ancient dragons. So what if we roll one or more dice? He's going to go ahead and deal one damage to each opponent. Much more budget friendly, those ancient dragons are very expensive to pick up, but very strong. Uh, so, that's anytime we activate Mr. House, any of our dragons attack, you know, we're, we're dishing out damage, we have a lot of other dice rolling happening. So I think Brazen Dwarf is going to go a long way in this deck. Chaos Channeler follows up that dwarf. Uh, this is another attack roll d20 trigger. Uh, so it's Impulse Draw, Impulse Draw, and you guessed it, more Impulse Draw. Chaos Dragon follows those guys up, has to attack every combat, and where he's going is really up to the dice. Uh, we don't really care if he sticks around, he's a flying hasty 4-4 four, four for 3. So he's going to get out pretty early. You know, he does have flying, so if your opponents aren't playing flying or reach, you know, all's well that ends well, you know what I mean? Delina, my wild mage, she follows up that chaos dragon and can really put in work. Uh, so whenever Delina attacks, we get to roll a d20. We choose a target creature and we're either going to create a tapped copy of it that gets exiled at the end of combat, or if we're a little lucky, we get to create a token of that creature that's not going away. And, it's also worth noting that that creature is not legendary, and we get to roll again. So ideally, we just get to keep rolling. We have a couple ways in here to kind of up the number of dice we're rolling. Uh, but even if we don't get it every turn, right, odds are about every three attacks we'll get to, like, kind of combo off with this. Uh... But when we do combo off, ooh, it's good. Hoarding Ogre follows up our Wild Mage. Another attack roll, D20. Uh, and they're creating us treasures, treasures, treasures. So, hey, you know, I'll take a single treasure. I'll take two treasures. You want to give me three treasures on, like, a 5% chance? I'll take it. Iron Mastiff. So this is another on attack, roll D20. Uh, and this is for each player being attacked. And we ignore all but the highest roll. But, I want to say that all of them will still count for House's ability. 
the ignore the all but the highest is really only affecting the Iron Mastiff himself. Uh, so there's a chance that we deal 4 damage to ourselves on attack. Doesn't feel great. Odds are technically in favor of the other two ever so slightly, uh, where we deal damage equal to its power to defending player or to each opponent. Lightfoot Rogue. Another on attack trigger, we're rolling a d20. Could gain first strike, could gain plus one plus o oh first strike, or ideally plus three plus o oh first strike death touch. Uh, you know, this might only be a one off sort of thing. I mean, if people are left open, you know, we're definitely trying to get in where we can. If they only have like one creature and that creature is important to their strat, you know, it's guaranteed to at least have death touch, so maybe they won't block. You know, it really just depends. But Lightfoot Rogue, pretty good, super budget. Last up for our creature dice rolls, we have Will, Blade of Frontiers. So for two mana, we get a 1-1. One, one. If we roll one or more dice, we instead roll that many plus one, ignoring the lowest roll. Again, fairly certain that ignoring the lowest roll just makes it so that we still get it for... We get all the dice for Mr. House, but we don't get all the dice for whatever we were rolling for, right? They don't want you having two dice for Delina where they both count. Things of that nature. And whenever we roll one or more dice, Will himself gets a little bigger. Uh, if he were the commander, we could choose a background to go with him. We're not doing that here. Dance Macabre, a sorcery for five. Everyone, including ourselves, is going to sacrifice a non-token creature, add the toughness of the creature that we sacrificed this way to our d20 roll. Uh, so we're either going to return a creature card, put into the graveyard from the battlefield under our control, or return two of the creatures, put into the graveyards this way to the battlefield under our control. Uh, either way, it's fine, right? It's good removal, we're rolling dice, that's probably what we want to be doing. So, Dance Macabre, pretty good. Mercruel's Edict. So this is a sorcery for two, we're going to roll a d20. A single opponent is going to sack a creature. Each opponent is going to sack a creature. Or, each opponent is going to sack a creature with the greatest power among creatures they control. Again, we're just kind of keeping the board clear, keeping our opponents at bay. Reckless Endeavor is going to have us roll two dice. Uh, they are D12, so odds of getting, you know, above that 6, still pretty good. Uh, or 6 or higher is technically above 50% for each of them. Uh, we get to deal damage to each creature based on the roll of 1 and create treasures with the other. So generally, especially for this deck, we're looking to just generate a bunch of treasures and maybe do a little bit of damage, right? We don't want to actually wipe our board. Thunderwave is in a similar spot, uh, so we're going to cast it for 4, roll a d20, maybe deal 3 to each creature. Um, Mr. House has 4 toughness, so this is fine. Uh, 10 through 19, we get to choose a creature and have it deal 3 to each creature that we didn't choose. Or, again, that like rare 5%. It's just going to deal 6 damage to each of our opponent's creatures, which would be Chef's Kiss, but not super likely. Grave Endeavor. Uh, so for 7 mana, kind of similar to the Reckless Endeavor, we're going to roll 2d10s. We're going to choose to return a creature from Grave to Battlefield with a number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on it equal to that result. Then each opponent will lose life and we will gain life based on the other result. So... The recursion's fine, the life gain is cool, uh, you know, in this instance, we're honestly looking to recur on the cheap end, deal damage and gain life on the high end, uh, but it's really those dice rolls that we're here for. Revivify is an instant, we're going to roll d20 at the number of creature cards that were put into our graveyard from the battlefield this turn, and return them either to hand or to battlefield. Uh, odds are definitely in the, um you know, two-hand side, but I think that's okay. Um, you know, if we lose a couple creatures, we could revivify it in speed. Really, we're here for those dice rolls, though. Will's Reversal. So we're going to choose a target spell or ability with one or more targets. Roll a d20. 
add the greatest power from among creatures we control. Hopefully it's not just Mr. House, because it would be adding zero. But either way, we get to choose new targets for the spell or ability. Or if we get a little lucky, we get to copy this spell and redirect both. Uh, so, nice and strong. Following that up, we have Component Pouch, which is a, an interesting mana rock. I actually run it in my dungeon deck, which we went over last week, but we get to remove counters from it to add mana of two different colors. And we could roll d20s to add components to it. Uh, 1 through 9 is going to give us 1, 10 through 20, slightly better odds, is going to give us 2. Um, really, it's the last source of mana that I ever end up using. Because ideally, right, we don't need it right away. We could kind of let these store up. It's a good time. The Lock Bobblehead. So it's a mana rock for 3, which not normally all that great, but good enough here. Uh, we could pay 1 and tap it to roll X 6-sided dice, where X is the number of bobbleheads we control. And create a tap treasure for each even result. If we rolled six exactly seven times, we win the game. It's not here for the alternate win con. We don't run any other bobbleheads. It's really just here to generate some extra treasures. Sword of Hours. So this is a little equipment. Uh, two to play, two to equip. Whenever the equipped creature attacks, it gets a little bigger. And whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage, we're going to roll a d12. If the result is greater than the damage dealt, or uh, it's 12, we get to double the number of plus one plus one counters on the creature. So a good way to kind of pass out plus one plus one counters to our various creatures. Uh, but really here for that d12 roll. Deck of many things. So we pay two, we roll a d20, subtract the number of cards in our hand. If the result is zero or less, we lose our hand. Um, if it's 1 through 9, we're going to return a random card from Grave to Hand. 10 through 19, we're going to draw 2. And again, that super rare 5% chance, we're going to put a creature card from Grave onto the battlefield under our control. And when the creature dies, its owner loses the game. So, super rare that we're going to get that 20. But if we do, right, we just take back a little dinky dude that our opponent's own, look for a way to kill it and laugh all the way to the win. Treasure Chest is up next. So, honestly, a little expensive, right? We're paying seven mana into this, possibly losing three life. Not realistically, but it could happen. We're gonna create five treasure tokens, which is ideal. We're gonna gain three life, draw three cards, which is also fine, but I prefer the treasures if I'm being honest. Or, we're going to search our library for a card. If it's an artifact, we can put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, we're going to put it into our hand and shuffle. So, honestly, modes 2 and 3 are pretty these. And then, obviously, 20 is amazing. You know, 1 is garbage. A vexing Puzzle Box. So, whenever we roll one or more dice, we're going to put a number of counters on it equal to the result. Uh, we could also tap it to add one mana of any color and roll a d20. And we could tap it and remove 100 charge counters from it to look for any artifact. And just put it onto the battlefield. Not usually a fan of these three cost mana rocks that add a single color. But Vexing Puzzle Box is an exception because again we're looking for those dice rolls. Wand of Wonder is a 4 cost artifact. It costs another 4 to activate it with a tap. We're going to roll a d20. Each opponent will exile until they hit an instant or sorcery. And then based on the die result, determines how many of those instant slash sorceries we get to cast for free. Uh, so 1 through 9 is 1. 10 through 19, slightly better odds, gives us 2. And if we actually get a nat 20, bam, we get to cast all 3 if we would like. Barbarian class doesn't actually have us roll dice itself, but it does increase the number of dice we get to roll. Uh, we could also level it up to make it so that whenever we roll dice, our creatures get a little bigger, have a little bit of menace, so that's nice. And if we wanted to really push it, we could take it all the way to level 3 and give our creatures haste. 
Maddening Hex. So the Enchanted Player, whenever they cast a non-creature spell, we're going to roll a d6. It'll deal that much damage to them, and then we're going to move it to a different opponent. Alright, so those are all the Dice Roll Matter cards. Let's move into the Treasure Matter slash Tokens Matter cards. Starting off, we have Smothering Tithe. Oh, you drew a card? You want to pay two? Cool, I'm going to get a treasure. <laughs> Revel in Riches is an alternate win con for us. Whenever an opponent... Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, we're going to create a treasure. If we have ten of those bad boys at upkeep, we just win the game. Black Market Connections is going to create us a treasure every turn for a single life. We could also draw cards with it. We could create some changelings with it. The first two... Really nice. That last one is fine. It's it's good if you have some, like, need for blockers and stuff, but I generally don't use it myself. Anointed Procession. You know, what good is one treasure when you could have two? <laughs> Idol of Oblivion is going to be like, hey, I see you're creating tokens all over the place. You want some card draw to go with it? And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> you know I want that card draw. Of course, we have a copy of Zorn. If we would create one or more treasures, we instead create... Those plus an extra one. So, not doubling it, but it is giving us an extra one. Professional Face Breaker. So, they are a menacey boy. And whenever one or more of our creatures deal combat damage to a player, we get to create a treasure token. And whenever we want to, we can stack those treasures to exile the top card of our own library. A little bit of impulse draw. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. Pitiless Plunderer is like, hey, whenever another creature we control died, we're going to go ahead and create a treasure token. We're okay with this. Of course, we're running Ogre Tack, Deepest Foundation, for that token tripling. Mondrek, Glory Dominus, for that token doubling. Mirkwood Bats, for every time we create a token, or sack a token, in terms of the treasures. We do have a couple other tokens we could make, but mainly treasures. We're going to be pinging our opponents down for life. Mayhem Devil, whenever any player sacrifices a permanent, we're going to ping a specific person, well, any target, really, uh, for one damage. Generally, we're hitting players. Marionette Master uh, has Fabricate 3, so we could create a bunch of little servo tokens. Uh, alternatively, we could just leave them nice and beefy. And whenever an artifact we control is put into a grave from battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to their power. In that sense, I prefer that we use a Fabricate 3 to just beef them up. Lortho, Corrupt Sheriff, whenever a player casts their second spell each turn. We're going to lose a life, but we're willing to pay that life to create that treasure. Jan Jansen, Chaos Crafter. Hasty little 3-3 three, three for 3. We could tap him to sacrifice an artifact creature to create two treasure tokens. And we could tap him to sacrifice a non-creature artifact to create... Two one one colorless construct artifact creature tokens. Really here to kind of like block with a three three robot that house made before damage is dealt to him that they would have died anyways. We tap this dude to sack them, create some treasures which are gonna feed into uh, into house. Grim hireling. So whenever one or more of our creatures deal combat damage to a player, we're gonna create not one but two treasures. And we could tap, not tap, we could pay a black and sacrifice treasures to uh, basically wither an opponent's creature. We can only do it at sorcery speed, uh, but still pretty strong. Wouldn't be a treasure matters deck without Dockside Extortionist. We don't really have a ton of ways to abuse him, though he does pair well with Delina Wild Mage. New boy, it's Crime Novelist, so whenever we sacrifice an artifact, we get to get him a little bigger, and we get to add red mana. So, now our treasures are effectively tapping for two, and we're pretty happy with that. Last up is Academy Manufacturer. If we would create a clue, food, or treasure, we're instead going to create one of each. This deck doesn't have ways to create any of the other two, but it is creating a lot of treasures, so we may as well make some extra food and clues to go with it. Now, of course, there are other cards in the deck that we didn't really get to go over. They aren't part of, like, the main core of what the deck is. It's a little more flavorful, uh, you know, kind of pick-your-own-adventure-style thing. Uh, if you want to take a look at the full deck list, as always, there is a link in the description down below. Um, 
really hoping that next week we have some Thunder Junction precons to start upgrading. If not, we'll do more custom builds. But if you guys enjoyed the video, go ahead and like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the doobly doos. You know, uh, leave some comments about what you liked about the video, what you didn't like, things I need to work on. Until next time, good luck with your builds.